Hello everybody, welcome to part four of our sessions on Greek mythology. Today we're going to be telling you the story of Orpheus, the Aidos, the son of the Thracian king, Iagoros, or Apollo, according to another version of the myth, and the son of the muse of epic poetry, Calliope. So the story I'm going to read for you um, is from the Osborne Book of Greek Myths, which uh, was written by Anna Milburn and Louis Stowell, and illustrated by Simona Borsi, Elena Temperin, and Petra Brown. But let us tell things, a few things about Orpheus. Actually, he had perfected the art of the liar so well. He could enchant fish, birds, wild beasts, and talking fans will love it. He could even make trees and rocks rise up and dance to the sound of his music. He could even divert the currents of rivers. And may I tell you the best of all, remember the sirens, those dangerous creatures who lured the sailors with their enchanting music and singing voices to shipwreck? It was Orpheus who saved the Argonauts from their doom on that day. And later on, when he put to sleep with his music, that sleepless dragon that was guarding the golden fleece. Until love knocked at his own door and he turned into a sleepless dragon himself. And now that's a warning for you. It's going to be a tragic story, which starts with love at first sight and ends with a tearful sight. But wait until we hear Rick Reardon's version as well later on. Enjoy. <laughs> Orpheus' Journey into the Underworld Orpheus was the greatest musician on earth. His music had an unbelievable effect on all who heard it. Wherever he played his lyre and sang, timid wild creatures would creep out of their hiding places to listen. Trees would bend closer to him and winds would stop whistling. As a young man, he had been employed on ships to calm dangerous seas with his soothing music. With such talents, Orpheus was never short of admirers, but his heart belonged to one girl alone. Gentle Eurydice. He loved her so deeply that when he sang of his feelings, trees sprang into blossom overhead and the sunbeams danced for joy. Eurydice loved Orpheus every bit as much. So when he asked her to marry him, she nearly burst with happiness. But the very day after the wedding, disaster struck. They were walking hand in hand through the forest when suddenly Eurydice cried out in pain. She collapsed into Orpheus' arms, her face deathly pale and her breath coming in short gasps. What happened? he asked urgently. She pointed to her ankle where Orpheus saw two tiny red tooth marks. She had been bitten by a poisonous snake. Moments later, Eurydice was dead. Orpheus was un inconsolable. Why did it have to happen to her? He wept. Why now? We'd barely begun our life together. Long after her funeral, he sat by her grave, hollow-eyed and ashen-cheeked, unable to accept that she was gone. Fred's friends tried their best to comfort him, but there was little they could say. Eurydice's death made no sense to anyone. Day after day, Orpheus sat motionless by his wife's grave. The summer faded. Trees shed their leaves like tears around him, and the sun's warmth ebbed away. Then one day, quite suddenly, Orpheus got to his feet and began to walk. He walked all day and all night and all through the next week until he came to a deep, dank cave with a steel pool of water inside. In the pool lived a pretty water nymph who swam over when she saw him. Hello, Orpheus! Won't you sing me a song? She asked sweetly, for she had met him once before and recognized him by the lyre he, had, he still had clutched under his arm. So Orpheus played... 
He sang to the nymph about his desolate sorrow at his wife's sudden death. I need to journey into the underworld to bring her back, he sang. The nymph's eyes brimmed with tears, and she pointed wordlessly to a small opening in the back of the cave. Orpheus nodded his thanks and set off into the dark tunnel. Down and down it went, past roots of trees and seams of glimming metal in the rock. Deeper and deeper he descended below the earth. The darkness became so intense that soon Orpheus couldn't even see his hand before his face, but still he strode on fearlessly. Gradually a strange, pale light filtered into his path, and the tunnel widened into a cavern full of enormous stalactites that dripped onto the stone floor, echoing eerily. Through the cavern ran an underground river, at the bank of which a dark, haggard figure stood hunched in a boat. It was the ferryman, Karen, whose job it was to ferry the dead over to the underworld. All around shadowy souls of dead people were drifting down to the river. Some were old and some were young. Some had terrible battle wounds, missing limbs or eyes, whereas others bore no signs of how they had died. They all crowded to the bank, whipping and moaning and clutching coins to pay the ferryman for, the par for their passage to the underworld. Orpheus joined them, shivering as their cold shadow bodies brushed against his warm, living flesh. When he reached the boat, Kieran looked at him sharply. I don't know what you're doing here, he said. I only take dead across, the dead across. My wife died not long ago, Orpheus said. I've come to take her home. Karen stared at him in disbelief. It's a one day journey into the underworld, he said. You can't take people back to the world of the living. That's impossible. Orpheus simply replied, I have to, I can't live without her. People lose loved ones all the time, Karen answered and sympathetically. It's the way of things. Do you suppose these people here don't have loved ones they left behind? You should consider, consider yourself lucky. At least you're still alive. There was a murmur of agreement among the dead, and they began to jostle past Kieran, handing over their coins as they went to get onto the ferry. You don't understand, Orpheus said very quietly, and she raised his lyre and began to sing. He sang of his love for Eurydice and how gentle and sweet she was. He sang of how she had died in his arms so suddenly the day after the wedding. The shadowy dead turned and watched him as he sang. The music was so hard trendingly sad that the rice filled with tears and he fell back to allow him onto the ferry boat in front of them. Even Kieran, whose heart was as hard and cold as marble, wrapped his hand over his eyes and gruffly said, Get in. A living body weighs more than a dozen dead souls, so Karen had to take Orpheus across the river alone. He paddled silently across the dull water, eyeing Orpheus, who clutched his lyre and said nothing. On the far bank was a pair of enormous gates, wrought from darkly glimming metal. The moment Orpheus stepped off the ferry, a monstrous three-headed dog leapt out of the shadows, snarling and slivering ferociously. It bared its three sets of teeth and lung towards him, ready to eat him alive. Orpheus leapt back hurriedly and raised his lyre. He sang to the best of his love for Eurydice, and how gentle and sweet she was. 
He sang of how she had died in his arms so suddenly the day after the wedding, and of how his life had no meaning without her. He sang on sorrowfully until tears spilled from the dog's six bloodshed eyes, and it lay down at his feet and whimpered with sympathy. Stepping past the monster, Orpheus pushed open the gates and entered the palace of Hades, god of the underworld. Inside polished black floors reflected twisted pillars leading up to a dark vaulted ceiling that echoed with the distant wails of wandering souls. Orpheus hurried through the palace until he found King Hades and Queen Persephone sitting on thrones. They were surrounded by crowds of shadowy dead, all waiting to find out which part of the underworld they were destined for, the dark pits of Tartarus or the garden paradise of the Elysian fields. All the dead surged forward when they saw Orpheus and touched his warm body with their cold shadow fingers. He's alive! He's alive, they whispered in wonder. Remember what it felt like, remember. Orpheus shuddered, but did not shrink away. Leave him, commanded Hades, and the shadows fell back. What makes you so bold as to come here before your time? The king demanded. I've come to collect my wife, Orpheus said. I've come to take Eurydice home. Persephone barked a cold laugh. What makes you think you can have her back? She asked. I cannot live without her, said Orpheus. It must have been some dreadful mistake. Persephone and Hades shook their heads. It was no mistake, Hades said firmly. So again, Orpheus got out his lyre and began to sing. He sang of his love for Eurydice and how gentle and sweet she was. He sang of how she had died in his arms the day after the wedding and how his life had no meaning without her. He sang of how he would rather wait in the underworld until he died than leave her behind without, leave without her. He sang and sang and his song drifted through the palace and out into the land of the dead. He sang until every single soul in the underworld was sobbing and wailing for an exception to be made. Orpheus kept on singing and per until Persephone turned to her husband and said, We have to give this man and his wife back. We have to give him his wife back. And he continued to sing until Hades nodded in agreement and he fell to his knees in gratitude. Eurydice herself had heard the song and was already waiting outside the palace when the guards went to fetch her. As soon as she was called, she hurried into the room. Orpheus tried to hug her, but his arms went straight through her shadowy body. Instead, he stared into her eyes, drinking her up in, her, in his gaze. Then Hades spoke up. Usually, you cannot undo what has been done whether it be deed or death. We're making a single exception to this rule, Orpheus, but there are two conditions. As you return to the land of the living, Orpheus, you must lead the way and your wife will follow. Until you both reach the light of the sun, neither of you may speak to each other, and you may not look behind you, Orpheus. If you so much as, so much as glance back, your wife will remain here forever and you will not be permitted to come here again until you die. Orpheus nodded. I understand, he said. Are you ready? He asked Eurydice. She nodded. After one long last look at her, he turned and led the way out of the palace. As he walked past the gates, the, and the enormous guard dog, Kieran, was just pulling up to the river bank with a ferry load of dead souls. Some of them nodded to Orpheus and one whispered, You did it! Good for you! 
Orpheus smiled nervously and got onto the ferry boat. Not turning to look at Eurydice was harder than he thought. He stared hard at the far bank as he waited for his wife to climb aboard. Eurydice was so light, the boat didn't rock or move in the list. In fact, Orpheus couldn't even tell that she was there, aside from Kieran's brief nod to him before they set off. When they reached the other side, Orpheus thanked Kieran for his help and got out of the boat. He waited on the bank for a moment for Eurydice to get out of the boat behind him. Then he set off on the path leading upwards. He walked quickly and quietly, his body longing to reach the light and get it over with, and his ears straining for any movement to reassure him that his wife was behind. There was none. Eurydice's footsteps were so light, they made no sound whatsoever, and all he could hear was the dripping of the stalactites his own footfall, and the rustle of his cloak. Orpheus drove himself onward, staring fixedly ahead. Whatever you do, he told himself silently, don't look back. The path seemed to go on forever, and all the way they walked in silence. Through the silent way of the damp underground, past seams of metal and the rock, up and up to the land of the living. As the path wound through tangles of tree roots, at last Orpheus caught sight of a small circle of bright daylight, shining like a jewel ahead of him. They were almost there. As he hurried closer to the light, he could almost feel the warmth of the sun on his skin. We've nearly made it, we've nearly made it, he cried. But in his excitement and relief, he forgot himself. In a moment, he would regret for the rest of his life. Orpheus turned around. Eurydice was right behind him, so close he could see the horror in her eyes. But as soon as he turned, she began to slip back the way she had come. She reached out her hands to him, but some invisible force was pulling her back. She was swept away until the darkness swallowed her up entirely. The last thing Orpheus saw of his wife was her pale, beloved face. Numb with grief, Orpheus turned and walked the past the last few steps into the warmth of the sunlight. Without even realizing what she, what she was doing, he raised his lyre and began to sing. He sang of his love for Eurydice and how gentle and sweet she was. He sang of how she had died in his arms the day after the wedding and how, against all odds, he had journeyed into the underworld, underworld to get her back. He sang of how he had turned at the last moment and lost her all over again. He sang and sang until the sky itself wept with sadness and the whole world mourned with him. But it made no difference. Eurydice was gone for good this time and there was nothing anyone could do to bring her back.